everybody in this room before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, you came with all your thoughts and came with all your stuff. <clears throat> Amen? Amen. You came with all the thoughts of the ways of the world and everything that's going on and everything that you believed you thought was right. And we're going to see tonight that, you know, um, an eye for an eye isn't what we're supposed to be. Repaying evil with evil we ain't supposed to be. Having resentments and doing all that we ain't supposed to have. Because we were judging everything that we have when we came in, came into the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. We came with a couple big Samsonites, the whole bunch of luggage. I know I did. I know I had a trailer and a couple containers. <clears throat> We're going to see tonight that I'm going to show you that <clears throat> this is a very serious chapter, and the trippy thing is, is there's a lot of Christians in this world that just call the Lord Jesus Christ his Savior, their Savior. Took me a long time to figure out that I needed a Lord. I knew that I was saved and I knew that I needed a Lord. But it took me a while in my walk before I learned that I needed to totally submit to the Lord Jesus Christ in worship of my life. Putting myself up on that altar, I squirmed a lot. Jumped off the altar. Wasn't a living sacrifice. We're going to see this in the first part. A living sacrifice is you. And back in the day, they gave dead sacrifices without blemish. Right? If you brought up an animal to that sacrifice, God didn't want it. He didn't honor that sacrifice if it was blemished. If it had a broken leg or there were spots or something, and you guys know if you read the Old Testament that it wasn't a sacrifice. He wanted animals that were whole and that were healthy, right? How would you say that they were pure? Not pure, right? So when we get up on that altar and we give ourselves to the Lord to submit ourselves to the Lord, it's the Lord Jesus Christ living in us that makes us pure, that makes us able to be a living sacrifice. Is that a trip? You could walk around for a long time, man, I'm saved, and I got it going on. And you could still have all that junk. That junk that you're walking around with because, why? Because you just have a Savior, not because you have a Lord. We learned that before, the, the name Lord is not just a name, it's a title. We had to submit to the Lord and let His will do it. And I'm going to tell you what, sometimes you're going to squirm. Right? But the, when you keep, and we're going to learn today, when we keep on praying, you know what? God made us righteous. But God is our Lord. Jesus Christ is our Lord. We're going to see people, you know, you see people going into churches, some jump around, some just sit there, some just worship, some just, you know, quiet, they're embarrassed of other. You know, the worship is not the music. The worship is not the music. The worship is an instrument, I mean the music is an instrument to make you worship when you're in church. But I want you to learn tonight that I want you to worship God every single day of your life. I want you to be a living sacrifice for God every single day of your life. And how do we do that? We're going to see this right now. We're going to learn tonight that everybody that's built something puts up a plumb line or puts something straight, right? You guys hang doors. You guys, some people build. If you started off your building crooked, what is going to happen? Everything in that whole entire building is going to be out of whack and out of order. And that plumb line that comes from down the wall, obviously down the roof, right? One plumb line. That's Jesus Christ. We need to hold all our standards, not our standards, but measure up to Him and build off that. There's nothing else that we could build off. Reading this chapter was like, again and again, I've, we've studied it. We've studied it in this room. We studied it in, down there. I've studied it before, Jen. And reading it this time going, wow, 
He's going to tell us this first part of the section and then it's like put on your shoes and get ready. Build on the cornerstone, amen? Because it's straight line. He is the truth. He is the true straight line. And if we ain't building off that, every time we go to with our thinking and people hurting us and doing this and we look at that straight line, are we measuring up? We're going to learn tonight how to measure up. How to measure up to that line and get right next to it and build off of it so we're straight. Because I'm going to tell you what, when we came to Christ, we were super crooked. A whole bunch of stuff was coming with us and ain't nothing good about it. When someone wrongs you, you get angry. We still do little things like that today. But we go in prayer, we're going to learn about prayer and everything tonight. This chapter is so amazing. Let me start out. Hopefully I didn't bore you with that. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Anytime you hear therefore, pay attention. Anytime you see therefore, he says, I beseech you. He's begging them, right? He's pleading with them. Right? This is Paul. But you see that says, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your responsible service. Right? I like that right there, that um, our body's a living sacrifice, like I just explained. Reasonable service. Oh, hold on. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Only we can do that as Christians. No other people on earth can do that. Because God lives in us. It's His temple. Right? He has made us clean. That's how we could be a living sacrifice. Knowing what He did on the cross for us. Two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I like that right there, renewing your mind. What I just say, we all came in this room with junk. Not in this room, in the body of Christ with junk. And how was our thinking? I love that when people tell me they aren't Christians, oh, you're just brainwashed. Well, let me explain something to you there, person. <laughs> I needed to be brainwashed. Because my thinking was so foul and so wrong and so messed up that I needed to what? Measure myself up with that what? That plumb line. Measure myself up with that straight line and build off that. Amen? Amen. And I'm talking to you too. And how do we know the perfect will of God? Right? Because Jesus Christ did it. Jesus Christ did it. We're going to line ourselves up with the Lord Jesus Christ. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone whom is among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but think, no, ought to, to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? We're going to walk. This is putting our shoes on and walking with God. This is putting our shoes on and walking out there among people that hate us and among people that things going on and we have to measure up what? To God. And um, a measure of faith. How do we get a measure of faith? Some people's faith is small. Some people's faith is big. Amen? I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that He's going to take care of everything that I, that's going on in my life. And your life too. From top to bottom. And we'll break this down tonight too. And I love that right there. Let me reread that. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of themselves more highly than they ought to think, but think sober as God has dealt 
to each one a measure of faith. When we came in here, before we came to Lord Jesus Christ, how many of us thought we were the cat's meow? How many of us thought our thinking was the best, like I just explained, and we were walking high and tall? I know I did. I know before I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, my ex-old lady said, Kenny, do you want to go to church? And I said, baby, you're with God. That's how much my thinking was. Just saying, we all think we're better than someone else. We ought not to think like that, right? How many people do you you see that like, oh man, I ain't doing this, they're doing that, I'm better than that. We ought not to think like that. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually individually members of one another having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us let us use them in prophecy let us prophesy in proportion in, how do you say that word proportion you said it right to our faith or ministry let the let us use it in our ministering he who teaches in teaching he who exhorts in exhortation he who gives with liberty he who leads in diligence he who shows mercy with cheerfulness and we could go to corinthians and we could go other places and see the gifts right we all have different gifts and we all work as one body. We all understand that because you've read it a whole bunch of times, right? And if we need to work with each other, we're going to see that right now. In mercy, let nine, let love be without hypocrisy, aborting what is evil, clinging to what is good. You know what the term uh, a hypocrite means? It means they're an actor. Back in the day, that's what hypocrite meant. They're acting. I don't want to be an actor in this. I want to put my feet to the ground and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Measure myself up to Him. Let love be without hypocrisy aborting what is evil, clinging to what is good. Be kind, affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honoring, giving preference, preference to one another. Do you, do you hate when the other team makes a goal? Are we doing that to each other? Right? Yeah. Are we clapping for the other team when they make a goal? Are we trying to be loving and caring to one another and exhorting each other and, um, uh, what's it called, um, helping one another in this? We'll break this down tonight because I know people will have a lot. Where are we, 11? Not lacking in diligence, fragrant, fra fragrant in spirit. Fervent. What? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, con continually steadfast in prayer. Are we praying for one another? Are we helping out? Are we praying for our enemies? I love this one day me and Russ were talking at the car show. We're not going to say the guy's name, but I, this is one of my enemies. And Russ told me, the other night that he was being more convicted, and we all know the scripture, what should we do to our enemies? We should pray and love on our enemies. But we need to pray more. We need to pray collectively. Not just at our homes, we need to pray collectively. Do you think Paul and them didn't, they got through this without prayer? No way, man. The main ingredients of this is prayer. 
If we are going to go in the battle and we're not praying together, how are we going to go in this battle? We're going to get beat up. If we're just praying one or two times at a gas station or a meat place and go, woo, we're going to charge the gates of hell, we're going to bring people out, and man, it's all going to be good. Kind of sounds like a real fast prayer to me. I think Paul was praying continuously without ceasing. Right? We're all going to have issues. And issues with other people. But what are we supposed to do? We're going to learn about that right now. Right? There are some people that you cannot deal with. But that don't mean that we don't measure ourselves up to what? The measure of Christ. That plumb line that we build off of. <clears throat> Distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality, bless those who are persecuting, bless those who persecute your... Oh, there we go. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, when we were not Christians, what did we do if someone persecuted us? Cursed them. We cursed them and we persecuted them even more. I know I was one of those. I am going to get mine. I am going to do what I said because <laughs> I'm righteous because I'm not building myself up against the Lord and I'm not even looking at that line because I didn't know him and now I'm going to get mine. And God is changing it up. He even says in Matthew and all kinds of other scriptures that I could read in this phone that I jotted down. That we are not supposed to repay evil with evil. We are not supposed to curse our enemies. Do you think Jesus said one word when he was getting persecuted? He didn't say one thing. He didn't say one thing, one bad thing about him, right? Not one. Is that crazy? He could have called angels down and smoked them. And I know, like, we're going to read that too. I know I've, as a Christian, said, Lord, that person has wronged me. Smite that fool, Lord. I want revenge. How many people have said that in this room? Oh, yeah. It's awful quiet in this room. <laughs> I remember a guy stole from me lots of money through a bike. And I was searching, I mean, trying to be this bike builder when I opened the shop. And I wanted to be a famous bike builder. And I said, man, I'm, that's my goal. I'm going to smoke Mondo down over at Denver Choppers because once I found out that he was a good fabricator, I said, I know motors and I could do this, right? And I let this guy build a bike in my shop and helped him. And I let him take his bike to this other place to put bars on it. And then I called him about 5, 6 o'clock. I've told you the story before. He said, I'm not coming back. I was like, oh, oh, oh. I'm killing this fool. When I see this dude, I am going to beat him. He goes, I will get a restraining order. I said, well, you can hold that piece of paper up all you want because it's not going to stop me. Then I started praying and praying and praying and asked the Lord to deal with this. The guy wins Las Vegas Bike Fest with the bike. Now I'm even more angry. Wins all kinds of things over at in Sturgis, huh, babe? Now I'm even more pissed. He wins Easy Rider of the Year. <laughs> and my name ain't on the paper. It is in Easy Rider in the middle section, wherever it is with two, three, four pages, and there was not one thing about my name in there. My name or my business. He did it all. I was like, oh Lord, Whew. you gotta help me. Because when I see this fool, when I, uh, man, I want to go to his house so bad and just smoke this dumbass. Excuse my language, this donkey. <laughs> I want to smoke him, smoke him. And the Lord said no. The Lord said no. The Lord said no. You could even ask my wife, I was struggling with this. 
And the Lord told me as I was praying, He said, you will never be famous building motorcycles. Wow. <clears throat> okay, Lord. That dude ended up dying at the lake. Wow. On a hang glider thing, jumping off the cliffs, a freak wind picked him up and threw him into the, into the bathrooms down there, the stone bathrooms, and killed him and drunk him in the lake. Wow. And I said, I didn't want that to happen to him. But then I found out after they died, he burned a whole bunch of people. That was a lesson, right? But I tell you what, man, it's hard sometimes. We have to persevere for, through this and do what the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do, to line up to what? That plumb line. To line up to that measurement of, that He's set before us that we could stand next to Him and build off of it. Amen? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Now we could go to Isaiah and you could see a whole bunch of places where God shows them not to be wise in your own opinion. There's a whole bunch of scriptures out there that I read. And you could see the humble people too, right? You ever see some fake humble? Man, you did a great job today, man. You did awesome. No, I wasn't that good. Come on, give it to me. I gotta have it, right? That's not humility, right? You've seen them. We want to be true, real Christians. How do we humble ourselves? The only way to humble ourselves is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have you heard for God good things in the sight of all men? If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. I think it said, if it is possible. There's some people that you can't, you know what, you want to leave peace with them, but there are some people that you cannot be around. It's a fact, it says it right there. There are some troublemakers that will just keep on keeping on. That's what it says right there. That's what I think. We could break it down. It says, if it is possible as much as depends on you living peaceable with all men, meaning us too. Beloved, do not revenge yourselves, but rather give peace place to wrath, for it is written, revenge is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, therefore if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Before we come to the Lord, if we had an enemy, would we want to feed him? Poison. Yeah, would you ever think, oh man, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go feed my enemies down the street that I hate. <laughs> I never thought that. I thought, man, when they get up out of their house, what do they got? They got any food? Oh, yeah. How about this? <laughs> if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing, you will reap coals of fire on their heads. Uh, that means it will be, it'll overcome them, right? That means that they'll see the goodness in you. We ain't supposed to live like nothing of the world. And that's super hard. Every single day I fail. But I always want to measure myself up to the Lord Jesus Christ and build off that every single day. I love that song, Today's New. Right? He is my champion. He is my Lord. And if you're sitting here, and before I read this last one, if you're sitting here today and He is not your 100% Lord of your life, 
and you're seeking after his will, all you have to do is go in that quiet place and say, I surrender. I want you to be my Lord. Direct me. I tell you the best time, and I know that, and I'm going to shut up after this, I know when I became almost 100% he was my Lord when I got into this motorcycle club. Just saying. Because the Lord Jesus Christ gave me this and he showed me, look, you're going to have to submit to me and this is my will for you. Ten years I ran from this club. And God said, no, I have something for you. And it's nothing to do with this club. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and the men in this club. But that was one of the most times that I said, you are my Lord. I will follow you. And I had to do it. There's a change in everyone's life. And if you're, not, if, you, if you're only having a Savior, you can change. And I'm not saying go join a motorcycle club. I'm not saying that. I'm saying jump up on the altar and give them your all. Give him everything, every aspect of your life. Because he wants it all. And how do we do that? We have to go in prayer and say, Lord, take this from me. Lord, take that from me. I don't want this, Lord. It doesn't measure up to you. Ain't that beautiful? And he's not going to go, well, not today. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Amen. That thing sticks with me so many times that I think about it when someone wants to be evil and wants to act crazy. And the only way that we could be humble in that and do good is by the Lord Jesus Christ. You could fake it and go, oh, I'm going to be good. But inside you're raging. That's kind of what I was going through pretty much all day with the rage and Scripture is just, you know, Lord pretty much telling me just, you know, vengeance will be mine. Don't worry about it, you know. And it was just, it was a thing that just kept stirring me and stirring me and driving me. And, you know, when everything came out, just felt a big relief. Because, you know, I don't know, it was just, just a crazy day for me. But, yeah, this chapter pretty much hits it right on the head. On my day, you know, you wanna, you wanna do the right thing as a Christian, but in the meantime, you've got these thoughts of, oh man, he needs to pay, or that guy needs to suffer, or whatever. And you know, God is telling me, well, yes, but you need to pray for him, you know, and and hopefully that whatever wrong was happened or that happened, that he will repent from it. It wasn't, it wasn't about the flesh, it was more about, about the spirit and the soul. So, but yeah, s scriptures just kept coming to my head and, I don't know, it was kind of weird. But yeah, being in prayer all morning and about it, just kind of, you know, and asking God to prep me for this, it, it worked pretty well. This is Isaiah 55, 8 through nine my thoughts are not your thoughts nor your ways are my ways declares the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts that's why I want to line everything up because my thinking was all messed up and my way of life was all messed up go ahead like Romans but this chapter is really great um, what what sticks for me or makes me think is uh, thy will not mine be done it's what I need to remember because right there you know I, I'm entitled everybody owes me something and I lash out or, or I'm thinking about lashing out you know what would Jesus do but I, you know that little simple simple saying what would Jesus do you know because um, this uh, like they always say like you're either in the world or you're in the book you know and it's and it does, and I, 
for me, be down on my knees in the morning praying, and it's just that one guy that cuts me off on the way to work, man. And all of a sudden, he needs to know, you know, what he just did. And it's like, boy, what, 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 what just happened? That quick, that quick. And like, really, what, what, what am I gonna do if he stops anyway? <laughs> No, I mean, like, really, what am I going to get into this? I mean, so it's like, you know, it's just it's a battle that, you know, um, not even the the physical thing, but just the the stinky thinking, you know, the bad the bad thoughts, man. You know, like they say, like, um, <clears throat> you know, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. You know, it's like everything, everything, um, everything plays a role in our life, um, whether we see it or not, but we realize it and we see it in others. It's kind of, it's weird, but um, just got to stay in the book and stay, stay in the Word and just remember that uh, it's not about us. Uh, I just, I love this. Uh, in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. <coughs> and I love how Paul is talking about this, like, based on everything we've already read, based on everything we've read in the previous chapters, his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness, his long-suffering, um, the only reasonable thing for us to do. And I love that, I love that uh, word, reasoning, because I, I, I shared with you guys a few months ago that while my mom was in the hospital, the Lord showed me that she was reasoning. And I, I, I hate, God knows that I love looking up words. And I know what the, the word means, but I love to see the full meaning. And it meant there was a place in it that meant, um, gosh, now I can't remember, <laughs> but uh, kind of, going back and forth with your thoughts. And that made me happy that my mom was at least reasoning that, um, and, and, I, and I thought about that here when I read this reasonable, what's reasonable based on what he's done for us, what, he's, what his character is. Um, it's it's a, the only reasonable service is to be that, like I love how Kenny described it, and it's, you know, uh, learning about it being being that living perfect and we are blemish free because God sees us as Jesus without blemish he sees only Jesus um, unless we're asking him to examine our heart but he sees perfection and that's how we are and it's I love how we're not in the analogy that Kenny used we're not a, a, a dead animal we're a living sacrifice and the cool thing is is that the part that's not perfect is dying. So as we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, the old Jennifer, the old Kenny, the old old, which there will always be some until we meet the Lord face to face, the old is is dying. And <clears throat> in the second verse, and do, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I love that that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the perfect will of God. The only way to have our mind renewed is the washing of the word. So if I don't read my Bible, I don't know God's will because his will is in that book. And uh, I need to know not just once, I need to, I need, we need to know it all the time, all day long, but I mean, never stop reading his word because it's fresh every day i mean i can't remember everything i read but when i go back and i read it i see something new and then there's a new you know conviction because everything runs contrary to the flesh in that book everything that i read when i first started reading the bible was like oh, oh, that has to change and that has to change and oh my god you know and and then and then the great thing you can do or i did or i do is when i see something that's contrary to my life which is all the time I can say, oh God, you have to change that in me. I can't, I can't do it. It is the way it is until he does it. And it's not like I can try to do it. I can't even try to do it. I have to say, God, this thing I see, thank you for showing me. 
do it in me because I, I can't. And then I might have to pray that again and again because it'll come at me, that same flaw, in different angles, on different occasions. So that's the beauty of the word. So, um, and then down here in, <clears throat> I love this too, the many members, number, uh, verse 4, for as we have many members in one body but all the members do not have the same function i love i love this body i love when i when i see all of you and i i miss all individually you guys when you're not here i i miss you i mean we all run on different gifts there's there's different things and some some have gifts that are speaking gifts like russell has this gift of prayer when he's not here not that bernie doesn't too but say they both weren't here you know what i mean it's like and the gift of just that when you guys are sharing, each one, each, each person that shares or doesn't share has a place in this body or other bodies, but specifically this one. And I long to see you guys. I love it. I, I feel like it's such a well-oiled machine w w when we're here and when we're not here. So if we get this kind of thing going where we're a, a one body and a well-oiled machine, we can go out there and ride around well you know, because we have each other, and we have each other, we know each other's circumstances. We're praying for each other. God prompts us for each other. We know, and it's different in church, and I love church, because I love to sit back and learn in that venue too, but I don't know everybody there, but I know, I know all of you guys, and the prayer the prayer requests help. I love this, this is, this is my favorite, and then I'll stop. Be kindly affectionate to one another with, with a bro brotherly uh, love in honor giving preference to one another that's that self sacrificial love involving an act of the will and where we seek the best for one another and the perfect example being Christ and I remember when my that's a my training ground for that was marriage because that was like boot camp for being a Christian because before before marriage I could pretty much find it easy to submit at work, at church, you know, at home, live with my mom for a minute. So that was kind of easy. And then you get married, and it's a whole new kind of submission. And, and the only thing in the Bible I could find was three times in Proverbs it said, don't nag. So I knew that was going to be a problem. I saw, I saw that I would have to submit, and that was, that was, that wasn't, didn't sound like it was going to be a problem, but it was, because I had to learn it. And then the other thing that I saw that was going to be hard, what was another thing? Oh, yeah, it was in Genesis that I was going to desire, that my husband was going to rule over me, but I was going to desire that, that ruling, too. So it was going to be a, a class. So I, I got every book I could, because it, there was, it didn't seem to be enough in the Bible, so I got marriage books. And I really, really, I thought if, I gotta, if I'm going to live life, i got to live life as a married woman. I need to know exactly how to be a wife. And, and it, it, that has been the best training ground for sacrificial love because cause it's, and it's beautiful. And, and the living proof of endeavoring for that in all of us as we endeavor to lay down our lives for our, our husband, wife, is uh, is you, you find out how easy it is because it's easy. It doesn't sound easy, but it's easy to let go once you let go. It's just easy. Not that it doesn't want to rise back up sometimes when I want my way, but like the things that are easier to let go are where we're going for dinner or who's going to sit where at the dinner table. You know, these things we used to fight about. I mean, seriously, I jump out of the car a couple times over dinner, but. And just, just to, to refer back to what Kenny was saying about this club and how he um, really gave his, surrendered his life to Christ. That, I don't see that. See, because even when Kenny was not fully surrendered, I would say um, he was always an awesome husband, Christian. I mean, not, you know, like not perfect, but praying with me, taking me to church, washing me in the Word, doing those things, even at if he wasn't acting um, accordingly at the shop or doing sneaky stuff at the shop, things like that. He was always, <laughs> I never doubted his Christianity. Now, when he, when he became um, uh, 
an army of the Lord and he had accountability, then it was amazing. Then it was amazing. So, and it's been amazing since. To live your life pleasing to God is what Jesus taught when he walked this earth. And to, um, to not have, uh, uh, live a life of self-motivation, you know, where it's all about for you. Um, and for personal gratification and satisfaction for you and for others. I think that's, that's too key. This ain't a new set of laws and rules that Jesus has set up. He has fulfilled it all, and through him we can do it. <coughs> so I want to specify that first because some people are like, oh man, it's just like the Jews, there's more rules. Paul's not saying that. Paul's saying, submit yourself to the Lord and he will show you and he will guide you and then go ahead. John is saying marriage is a training ground by the same <laughs> token. It is absolutely a perfect way for him to reveal all your flaws as he did with me. So I had already started a Celebrate Recovery program and I had started reading some biblical based marriage books and as I was going through it I'm marking flaw, flaw. I mean it was it seemed like every other page I w he was highlighting this is your flaw, this is your flaw. So by the time I actually started a 12 step study I already had a whole laundry list of flaws and I, rem I can't even tell you how many times I've read Romans 12 uh, that was very key to my interaction with my husband and my husband would be the first to tell you I treated him like the enemy. Uh, coming out of my childhood, my first marriage, any kind of betrayal of trust, uh, which in my husband's case there was, you were now my enemy and going into that self-sufficiency survivor mode. Walls go up, they're impenetrable. And it was, I can't say I've ever been the type of person that would go after you, but certainly if you, I felt you were coming after me and I was in the corner, I was definitely in fight mode. So I, that's why I chuckled when you said, because it just, it highlighted so many flaws. And as I was reading, because um, I, I, like I said, I've read Romans 12 many times, reread it again last night and today I was in 1 Samuel 23 and it was a perfect tie-in to where uh, and Russ correct me if I'm wrong when David goes to fight and Ke 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 <coughs> is that how you pronounce it essentially uh, he's listening to the Lord he's following the Lord's command and what was what really stood out in in 23 for Samuel was the fact that just because Saul saw David as his enemy, the Lord did not see David as Saul's enemy, and he protected him when David was out in the wilderness. And it, it there were, in one of the commentary, I thought this was uh, great, and it tied into Romans 12. Uh, Alan Redpath, he says, he is now looking at God. First he was looking at his enemies and these supposed friends of his, but now he sees them through God. If you begin with God, your enemies grow small. If you begin with the enemy, you may never reach God. So it was just a, a key reminder that I can't look at somebody simply because they've hurt me, they betrayed me, in whatever way I'm feeling offended, because as soon as I do, we know that is a bait of Satan going to John Bevere's book, The Bait of Satan. He's going to lead me in every direction that the Lord doesn't want me to go. So if I'm focused on God versus the enemy, as it says in Romans 12, leaving God that room for wrath He's always going to vindicate us. So one of my key character flaws, self-indignation, you know, and feeling I was wronged and that 
allowed me to carry a fence. And it was so damaging to the marriage. And now, thankfully, he's he's pointed out all those flaws and you know, working through those, and now the marriage is in the process of reconciliation. So, just to kind of caveat off of what you were saying that goes along with this, um, David never took out Saul even though he had numerous opportunities because David looked at Saul as being God's anointed and appointed. Even though God offered him up numerous times, mm -hmm. he didn't take that position. <coughs> Um, and Gary shared something about the humility and the position of, of being humble and staying in the book, um, which I think it illustrates especially this, this section of this uh, 9 through 17, 18, 19 because um, it, it talks about behave like a Christian. And so we go into 10, which Jennifer hit on, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. We're all sitting in this room currently. We look around the room and we say, okay, I can do that, right? Then you go to the next one, it says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Nobody in this room's ever really pissed me off, right? Now, this is me. Well, maybe once or twice. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Getting in the neighborhood. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Now, when someone so pisses you off, are you still in the neighborhood of rejoicing in hope that God's going to change this? <laughs> Am I drawing a picture? <laughs> All right. And being cheerful that even though at work I asked Cody three times to do this, <clears throat> the fourth time he finally gets it done, knowing that there's still hope. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needy of the saints, giving to hospitality. Looking around the room, that's easy. We all love each other, right? We can do it through the hope, through our relationship, through our bondage with Christ as fellow servants, right? Or, or slaves. God's slaves. That's what Paul taught us. But now we're going to swap feet. And theo theologians think that this is where the chapter changes because it says, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Those ain't them people in this room. Those ain't your family. Those aren't fellow Christians. They're probably not ones that you're working on to become Christians. That gets a little extra slack. You know, a little extra favor. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Half of this chapter I have highlighted. For some reason, this one I don't have underlined. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Because I think I'm pretty stinking smart. <laughs> And I've had this marked up for a long time. And that is the one scripture that isn't highlighted. What was I thinking? <laughs> you were pretty wise. I'm pretty stinking smart. Now, I did learn a long time ago that Proverbs, it says, better to keep quiet and remain a, or appear a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> so I'm somewhere in between the two. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Okay, I don't know about you, but that, that knocks you down a level. All men. Have high regard for all men and women. Amen? Okay, I kind of suck there. So let's go back to 9, which I skipped on purpose. 
Let love be without hypocrisy. Quit acting. Are you really a Christian? Then the Bible says we're to love our enemy. That was what me and Kenny was talking about last week. Not just like them. Not just put up with them. Not just deal with them. Not just ride with them. It says to love them. Holy cow. There's no way we can do that without being focused on Jesus Christ and centered in His Word with lots of prayer and supplication. Because there's some people in this world, sometimes in this room, but mostly in the world, that are really, really, really difficult to love. How many got family members that are like that? <laughs> we can't do it. And Kenny started off with that. Paul is trying to show us. This is this is the measuring rod. And the funny thing is, is the one part Kenny didn't mention that I think is really, really important is the Bible tells us over and over again that what's supposed to be our foundation? Jesus Christ. So I am a builder. And if that foundation isn't level, your whole house is racked. There is nothing going in that house that's going to be right. Nothing. It starts with your foundation. And if your foundation getting up every morning isn't Jesus Christ, and that isn't your rock, then somewhere between home and work, some idiot is going to pull in front of you and you're going to want to tell them they're number one. And God's going to remind you, you just blew this scripture. It's all about God. And it's all about that unconditional loving heart. The only part, the best part that helps me in that is remembering how unlovable I was when God loved me. Amen. Huh it was bad and and somebody I'll run into every once in a while reminds me remember when mm. oh yeah I wish I didn't thanks for reminding me so it makes it a little easier to love the unlovable especially those that don't know Jesus Christ because we know where they're going and we know how miserable they are in their walk right now I was going to say what, what Jen had said earlier, but I want to touch back on that. You know, it, he starts out by telling us to be a living sacrifice, and he gives us the tool for it. And then he goes on and says the things that we need to do. As I'm, I'm listening to everybody speak, what is, what is John, John 1, I think it is, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus Christ, the Word. The whole key to this is right here, by the transforming of the renewal of your mind. And I'm listening to what everybody's speaking, and as everybody's speaking, they're saying, this is the experience of my head, this is what I did, and this is what it says over here in Scripture. This is what it says over here in Scripture. So you would know that if you weren't. The, transform, the, the transformation by the renewal of your mind comes from this. Jim hit it on the head completely. If we're not in this... How are we going to know if we're not reading? You know what I'm saying? You, have, you wouldn't be pulled. Uh, each, like I said, each and every person that spoke has given scripture, other scripture to back up the other situations and saying, man, this is hard, this is hard, but it says over here to do this, it says over here to do this. <coughs> that's, the transforma that's the transformation, that's the renewing of your mind that only comes from this. And that is Jesus Christ. Um... I did say the cornerstone, right? And that's what we built up. Let me just read this to you, and then I'll read one more little thing. And this is Amos 8, uh, 7, 8. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I have set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. Mm. All right, and let me read this one like we're all talking about, and this is our Lord Jesus. And you can look in 
many scriptures will know that, you know, in Corinthians it says that our body is a living temple, bought and paid for, right? That's why we should do this. But this is what me and this is what we have to go with, and this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, 45. You have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's Old Testament. But I say to you, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's right there. That's what Paul's talking about right now. Like, And we're not going to do it perfectly, but every single day, if we read the Word, it's going to come to us. And we're going to be transformed. Trans, our minds will be transformed. Right? And I'll say again, if you think that you're wise, I thought I was wise. We all thought we were wise. But we're nothing compared to the Lord. Which, and what is so awesome that we have His book and we have His Holy Spirit living in us to do this. Not all these rules and regulations. Oh, section 25, i got to act like this because I ran into this person or this or that. Right? And when you miserably mess it up, believe me, you're not going to miserably mess it up the next time. Yeah. You're going to go through all kinds of stuff. You're going to miserably fail as a Christian. And if you say that you haven't, you know, and I love that that people tell you that you're not a Christian. Don't believe that. And the other thing is, is if they're not a Christian, and they're messing with what? God's children. You're in deep, not you, they're in deep, deep trouble. Deep trouble. I've seen it a hundred times. Where someone goes after a Christian and poof, a rabbit out of their hat. It isn't good. And you could see that all around. God's going to protect His. If you're diligently seeking Him and saying, Lord, use me today. Lord, I want to do Your will. He's not going to go, ah, I'm going to let Him get... You could get killed or whatever. We're all going to heaven, right? That know the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm saying here on earth, God ain't going to let a whole bunch of people mess with you. We've seen it plenty of times when people went after us in craziness. You don't know how many times God has stopped stuff from coming to boulder choppers. I believe that 100%. Yes, sir. You know, I, I want to uh, thank you for what you said because uh, I've been sober. I just celebrated 32 years clean uh, yes, last see. week. And, and I've been carrying this thing around for about 27 years. About my, my, my daughter was beat up by her uh, husband at the time. And I uh, told him we got a dance coming. So I knocked his ass out one time. And I said, you never do it again. I'm going to kill you. And he did. And um, and I've never been able to run into him since that day. But and if I did, he was with my granddaughter, and so I couldn't really do anything because I it, I've revenged everything my whole life. I'm a physical person, and, and uh, you know I haven't I swore off violence when I got clean, so I haven't touched somebody except for him in 32 years. And then what you just said, now I'm going to get in my truck and bang my head on the steering wheel and say, God, I got to forgive this kid. I gotta love him, and, and, and you know I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I definitely do not want to. And um, but but I know because I've been not, for 90 something percent of my my life is in God's will, God's will, and, and in line with God's. But th there's one area you mess with my family, something happens to me, and, and I'm gonna take care of that. Just like what you said earlier, you know that's one guy and that money and the bike and all that. You know it's like I don't know what it is, but something inside of me goes weird and, and I shut everything else out and I'm just going to take care of that business. But now that I heard it, because I've read, like you said, I've read that dozens of times. It just never registered like that, like what we talked about tonight. So I thank you for that. And uh, you might just save somebody's life. <laughs> and yeah, my, yours. And mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, things that stood out to me was like in, in the very beginning and, and Jen and Lyle had mentioned it about the very first thing that Paul writes is that uh, <clears throat> to present our bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is your reasonable service considering everything else that we've learned uh -huh. what Paul had said that you know that salvation was 
for everybody that, that Jesus Christ died and, and for us. I mean, that's that's a reasonable thing to do. But how do we do that? How do we do not be conformed to the world, but to transform <coughs> by renewing of your mind? How do we do that? Well, we know. How. We've, we've already talked about that. Like in Romans, I think it's 10, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, the Word of God. Um, that's a powerful little verse um, because none of this is possible without that renewing of the mind. Mm. None of it. And uh, down in verse 3, it says, serve God with spiritual gifts. That's the what my Bible says for the following verses. I think it's 3 through 8. Um, all these gifts that, uh, that God has given to each and every person some some greater some not you know it's like the body you know an ear can't see and and uh, the eye can't you know make you walk straight every every piece of the body is important this is the body Jesus body the Christ the, the church you know um, everybody has an important role and uh, I know that in some churches particularly mega churches things have gotten twisted around that We've got these rock star preachers in a lot of cases that that really seek uh, the fame, the glory, the money. You know, it, it's a, it's a twisted Christianity, and Satan's really good at, at, at twisting things. Um, but I like how it says that all these gifts—they're not for us. They're not for our adoration. They're to serve God, to serve His church, to serve His people. And I, I like what it says in uh, I, uh, in uh, the King James, First Corinthians one twenty seven. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So I heard Pastor Chuck teach on this. So when we start thinking that we're all that, God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things to the world to confound the things which are mighty. So before we start getting all puffy, <laughs> I think I think Pastor Chuck just nailed that. Just you know, keep it in check. We're here for a purpose, you know. And down in, I like down here, in, rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 2.9. But it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared, prepared for those who love him. That's the hope we have as believers. The world doesn't have this hope. I was thinking about this over the weekend um, at the, the soldiers' Bible study. There's a whole group of men in there, and every one of them has got hope. Every one of them has got the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them has a message to bring. And, every, and we all do. That ministry, whatever ministry that we're in, we have that, right. that message to bring that's hope, particularly in a dark world. And everybody in this room is well aware of how dark things are getting. But we have hope. Right. We should underline that, highlight it. The hope, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We need to share that hope. And, and you guys do. You guys do a really good job. You know, I mean, prayerfully, we all do. You know, uh, to, the, to the people in our, in our circle that, that God has, had, the people that he's brought into our lives, that, that we should be able to share that hope. That's it. Do you think we covered 12? break.